Welcome back to another episode of Live with Karisha. I'm your host, Karisha Diva, and I would like everyone in the audience to make some noise for content creator, artist, GOAT, Cy Arita K in the hot seat, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the show. What's up, what's poppin'? I, it was poppin', here you are. I have so many questions, but I wanna start with an icebreaker. I'll start with icebreakers today. An icebreaker? Yes, an icebreaker. Okay. So my first question to you is, Jack Harlow has been making quite the buzz in the game, and people are saying that he's surviving off of white privilege. What's your take on that? Um, I think being white helps if you wanna start with the color of the skin thing. But um, Jack is fucking dope, bro. Like, I just think, I think he's really good at what he does. I think it, some some white artists is hard to listen to, um, and then sometimes when they try to act black, it makes it a little tough. But I think he's listening to his album. It sounds like he's telling his story. I feel like I I know exactly where he came from, what he represents, um, and I can't be mad at him for that. I mean, there's pros and cons to anything. Right. There ain't nothing easy, nothing. But I mean. I don't look at it like that. I look at the positive side of things. He ain't bothering nobody. He ain't saying the N-word. He's not, you know, downplaying the culture. You know, I like what Jack is doing. I think he's one of the dope, I don't wanna say white artists. I think he's one of the dopest artists right now. Like, I think he's doing his thing. And he a young dude, so I, I ain't saying nothing bad about no kid like that, man. Period. Salute to Jack Harlow. He do. Plus, I fuck with drama and yes. um, Royce over there. That's my mans. So it's a lot of people behind Jack, too, that I fuck with, so I'm not going. I don't believe in that. Very well said. So, um, started in New York. You started your career right out of high school. Yeah. Well, okay. Kinda. Well, yeah. What was the transition like? Um, I just think, like, I struggled with school. Like, school was super hard for me. Um, I had issues sitting still, um, didn't read very well, um, didn't like taking orders, didn't like to be on time, on other people's time, that is. But uh, I think when I graduated, I, um, I, I was always a nigga that was, like, always outside. So, you know, when you outside and you rapping at the same time, it's only a certain amount of time before something happened, so right. um, at that time, I don't know if you remember in Atlanta, Coco Brother was on 107.9 from 6 to 10, not the Dirty Boys. Right. Um, and he was doing Freestyle Friday. I remember. Yeah, I yeah. remember. He was doing Freestyle Friday, and one of my peoples back then, he, uh, he, he knew the time that you had to be outside to audition to get upstairs when the intern came down. So he was like, yo, let's pull up over there one day. Now, you know, all through high school, like I had a whole lot of rhymes and shit. I used to rap with my homies and shit. Right. Battle like after school and shit like that. So um, he was like, let's go up there. So uh, we went and it was like maybe like 40 people outside trying what? to get upstairs, yeah. And it was like a champion up there that had already won like three, four times. So I, uh, the intern came out and he was just pairing everybody up, like, y'all go for 30 seconds, y'all go for 30 seconds. And I ended up beating everybody outside, then I went upstairs, and I beat the champion that was already winning. And then I did it for 11 weeks and retired without losing. Wait, wait, this was straight out of high school? I was 18, I was straight out of high school. What? Yeah, yeah. And I, um, I won 11 weeks on 107.9, and that was like my introduction to like saying, Yo, I'm not doing no school shit. I don't really want to do too much work and I want to do this. Right. And that was like the introduction to me saying I'm going to do music, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Did you have like, did you have a clear vision at that part? At no, that okay. no. You was playing about your... Yeah, like Jim Jones had a comment today on a, on Million Dollars Worth of Game. He said, uh, even times when you lack motivation, just be consistent. And I think I always was good at that. 
I think that times when I didn't always see what was about to happen, my activity, if it's anything I learned from school, because I didn't really get much from school, but you know what I'm saying, was there anything I learned from school was stay on task. That's the one thing that I took from school to the street and to my work ethic was stay on task. And I think that with music, I always outwork people doing that. So I always saw the work as opposed to like saying, oh, I'm gonna be this when I get older, I'm gonna, you know what I mean? Right, if you could go back in time and tell your younger self some advice, like at that point when you started going crazy on 107.9, what would you tell yourself? Um, nah, I wouldn't really give myself any different advice. I think I was doing the right thing at that time. I was young, hungry, I was wild, I didn't follow rules. You know, I had this real like fucking mentality and I wouldn't, I wouldn't shelter that for anything. So I wouldn't really change the advice. I just think the only issue I had fresh out of high school was I thought that the niggas I grew up with, you know, I try to take all my niggas with me from day one and I think that you get caught up in loyalty and um, the people you, that your day ones and sometimes you try to bring them farther than that they're capable of going with and I kept a lot of people around me that didn't deserve to be around me at that time. So I probably would have told them like, yo, these couple niggas ain't gonna be here later, just go ahead and ditch them now. Um, but like I said, the timing of it was perfect for what I needed to go through, so I ain't got no regrets. That's good, that's real good. Um, your, I seen on your YouTube channel, like your first song, your first upload was 300 Spartans with Migos and K-Camp. <laughs> I went back in time. I mean, it was like 26 people on there. It was, it was like a whole lot yeah. of artists on there. Yeah. Was that your first major collab? Uh, nah, not no. my first major collab, because even before that, like, when my artistry started, the people that was hot was, before that was uh, Waka Flocka. Shout out to Waka Flocka. Um, Roscoe Dash and Travis Porter. They was like killing Atlanta at the time. I don't know if you remember that. I remember. And I had produced a record for um, Two Chains and um, Dollar when they was uh, Play a Circle. Mm -hmm. So that was like my first kind of intro. You know what I mean? Because when Waka and all of them was coming up, I had songs with all of them already. So that was like my first before I. But I got cool with the Migos before they took off too. And K Camp, me and K Camp went to the same high school. So. Yeah, probably. But that was one of my big collaborations that I put together with 300 Spartans, for sure. Okay. Do you, out of all of the artists that you was kicking it with back then that's doing their thing now, which one has, like, inspired you the most or left, like, the most lasting impression on you? Um, I'd probably say all of them. Every artist has inspired me and vice versa. But I think out of everybody, the biggest lesson for me was Waka. Mm. Um, Walk and, Slim Dunk, walk and Slim Dunk and rest in peace. Because I grew up, I'm from the Bronx, so we created hip hop, so I'm used to, shout out to all the New York niggas in the building. But we birthed hip hop, so we're trained to understand lyrics, content, you know, cyphers, freestyles. So when you come from that, you kind of hold hip hop to a high regard, right? But when I came here, I used to judge music too soon. And I think that me growing up listening to, you know, Biggie, Nas, Big Pun, Big L, I came down here and it took me a while to understand. But I think what Waka did, he humbled me because I got to, I grew up in the teen clubs as a kid. Right. You know, knock a few buck and all. I started to see a different culture. Right. So when Waka used to come to my studio and seeing him create, I think I grew a different understanding for people that couldn't count bars or couldn't. They, they had a different gift to me than people from New York. Right. They had a different culture and cadence in the way they chose to ad lib that, how, how loud he wanted to yell at a certain part. Um, like if you listen to Oh Let's Do It, like the first four bars don't even rhyme. <laughs> you know, at all. It sounds good though. It's amazing, it's you know funny. what I mean? So I, I think I got motivated from Waka because he helped me like, people don't know this, but I recorded All The Way Turned Up by Roscoe Dash. Mm. That song, All The Way Turned Up, with him and Travis Porter, I recorded that song in my studio. Oh, wow. Yeah, so so being able to see them niggas create that whole turn up wave right, right in front of my face, those niggas motivated me because I was able to adjust to Atlanta through them. Right. So I'll probably say them for real. That era was super important for me. Shout out to them. So, and you also did some, go you do Ghost Riding. 
Uh, I ain't gonna say ghostwriting. I have, but most of my writing that I got plaques for and got nominated for a Grammy for, I got credit for. So that's to me, that's not ghostwriting. Okay. Ghostwriting is when I write something for you, you put it out and pay me under the table and nobody knows. Right. But I ain't no ghostwriter. No, I so get, you're not game for ghostwriting. I mean, nah, I'm not. I mean, I get credit. I got right. plaques for shit that I've done. I've that's, got, as you should. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, another credit that you've done, shout out to Benny the Butcher, you was co-signed by another dope, yeah, another dope New York rapper. Yeah. What was that like? What was that moment um, like? Y'all killed, y'all killed that <laughs> song together. Yeah, shout out to Benny. Um, now I met Benny through uh, this chick named Kat, because I had met Fabulous right before that. Fabulous called me to a studio in New York, in New Jersey. Um, this chick named Kat from the Bronx, she worked with them like behind the scenes. She do a lot of shit with Benny right. behind the scenes. She ain't really in the forefront. And uh, she told him about me and shit. He had an artist named Young World from Buffalo. Okay. So I went and worked my one too. And Benny was like, yo, do a record with my artist. I'm going to look out for you. And I was like, fuck it, let's get it. And I actually fucked with Young World. He was dope. We did a record. And then uh, me and Benny, that's why I tell people everything is not always about money or politics, you know what I'm saying? And I think that Benny, he saw that I was a nigga, he never even came to me trying to sign me or nothing. He could tell I had my own bag. He knew I was a boss, he knew he knew the vibe, you know what I mean? Real recognized, bro. Yeah, so, and I think at that time, he saw the work ethic, he kept tapping in with me, he kept hitting me like, yo, I still got you on that record. And I told him I was wrapping up the album, and I ended up doing my concert out here in Atlanta. Right. Did it no promoter, didn't do no radio promo, nothing. And I uh, packed that shit out and he came out, he, he DM'd me and was like, yo, I'm about to pull up and fuck with you. And he came to the show for free, for I've nothing. I've seen that on your yeah. Instagram. So uh, it's just shit like that that I fuck with. Right. You know what I mean? And um, a lot of the legends that opened the doors for me and, and, and showed that love when they didn't have to. Cause you know, this industry is full of bitch ass niggas. We all know that. You know, this industry is full of people that don't keep their word. You know, they, they, they're opportunists or they do things for certain reasons without, you know, a good motive, you know what I'm saying? So I, I salute Benny for that. I, I see you're very open about that, about, excuse my French, not fucking with the industry niggas. Yeah, I don't. Not one of them. I, do, I don't fuck with industry niggas. Not saying people in the industry, because I'm in the industry, you're in the industry. But if you don't really have that code or type of work ethic to stand behind what you say and do, right. I'm not fucking with you. If you don't have that self-made entrepreneurship attitude and, Stand behind something you believe in. I'm not fucking with you. I don't care who you is. Right. You know, and, and anybody that know me knows the situations that I have done business wise, or you know, keeping my word on things and putting people on. I don't got a lot of people deals, opportunities, put them on game, and I stand behind that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. On the song with Benny, I, 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 in your lyrics, you talk about your brother was facing charges. How's he doing? He good. He um. My brother um, dealt with something, you know, federal, doing time in prison. Um, that was hard for me. But, you know, everybody go through shit like that, you know, so I always put my life through the music. I like to tell my story. I always tell artists, a lot of artists are focused on going viral or, you know, making this one hit wonder. You know, I think when you focus on your story, you can never lose. You can never stop being motivated because you know what you did today. I could talk about this day by day. Um, so yeah, my brother's good. He got out. You know, he out now, free, and uh, he ain't never going back. You know what I'm saying? We gonna keep him out. Yes, yes. Much much for the brother one time. And the song with Jadakiss, Unbreakable Promises, another dope song. You been working with all of the goals. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was that like? Um, that was probably the biggest, most important feature to me. Cause Jadakiss was somebody I studied growing up. Like he was unreachable to me as a child, right? Um, first of all, shout out John John the Don and Bart. Bart is John John the Don brother. They connected me with Jadakiss. You know, they the ones that put me. I was at Rugs Club, uh, on Buckhead downtown, something like that. And uh, Kiss was up there, and it was like, "Yo, come chop it up. What do you want? Chop it up with you." We got to uh, talk about how I was gonna get the record done. And um, you know, right before they did verses mm -hmm. with with um, Dipset, they had a concert in Virginia. And um, I'm gonna tell you how to capture some opportunity. Um, I did the record with Kiss. He did it in like a week. He knocked it out for me, right? Okay. 
And I told him, I was like, yo, however I can get this video done, I know you're busy, I know you got verses coming up, but I will I will come anywhere you at, bro, to get this shit done. Hungry. And uh, I think that he had a show with Dipset and Beanie Siegel in, in uh, Virginia, what? right? And I was like, um, you know, I got my sprinter and shit, so I'm like, yo, if I gotta drive over there, get my own room, so I hit my man Bart, who'll be on the road with him, like, yo, what's the itinerary for kissing him? I wanna pull up and whenever he done with the concert or before or after, I get his scene real quick and we'll shoot it. And it, this is just a story about having artists stay prepared. So I got my camera, my camera nigga, my driver, my other man that's kind of thorough if something go down, and we hit the road. Met him at the joint, so I find out where they hotel was at. So I booked the room. You booked up at the hotel? Yeah, yeah. I got there before them. Booked the hotel room where their room was at so I could chop it up in the lobby for politics. Right. Then they went to the concert, you know what I'm saying? Went backstage with him, chopped it up with all the legends. And then um, after, he was sitting in the front of the hotel just smoking. He was like, yo, if you want to shoot now, let's do it. We shot it in the middle of the street. Like, when you watch that video, it's in the middle of the street in VA, like, right outside. We seen the video. We, yeah, we, seen, we seen the video. Yeah. Shout, out, shout out to VA on the right side. So we shot that video in, like, 40 minutes. What? He didn't even know his words. Like, it was like, <laughs> I didn't even know my words. We could, we we could not happen. tell. It's just about being prepared. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And you got to keep the clip loaded. Everybody right. always waiting for the right opportunity or waiting for the right management of bag. Sometimes you gotta just go without thinking, you right. know? And I think that was that's a clear story. I think he respected how prepared I was. He could not not shoot that video with me that night. I mean, you done pulled up at his hotel. He like, showed me, I was patient. I was sitting there kicking it. As soon as he gave me the green light, he pulled the lights out. Lights look just like that, straight out the sprinter. And on the middle of the block, no security. Everybody got their pistol on, just ready to, him too, and just ready to shoot, you know what I'm saying? Literally. A movie. So your album, The Shadow and the Shade, a dope body of work. Have you have y'all heard the album? If okay. you haven't, go listen to it. It's, yes, if you have yeah. not heard it, we got to Joe Button Podcast and Marlon and Robert, they all say, like, I got one of the top albums right now. So, you know, go check I'm it out. I'm going to co-sign it, too. It's co-signed by the Diva, too. It's definitely one of the top Yeah. So, I, absolutely. Um, I think I heard, I read that you were taking your time with this one. Before I put it out, because you wanted it to, you wanted to feel a certain kind of way. Did it come out the way you wanted it to? Was there some things you would have done differently with the album? Uh, well, those who kind of know my music, I kind of like to do projects cohesively, like where one song kind of somewhat blends into the other. I didn't really do that with this one because this was like the first full body of work I did, hip hop all the way through, mm -hmm. with like no melodies and nothing like that. Um. It came out how I expected, you know okay. what I'm saying? So, but on the second one, I'm working on the second one right now. I'm halfway through. So, and I'm when we get in the second one? I'm at, oh, I'm working on the Shadow and the Shade too. Before the year over, probably like August or something like that. I'm already, and I dropped that one in March. So I'm already like, I got some crazy shit coming. Just, you about to see. We about to see. <laughs> we about to see. Um, you've contributed so much to the hip hop game. You work with so many dope artists. You're a dope artist. Do you feel like you've gotten your flowers? For all your contributions? Um, well, yeah, I mean, th that's what my album is about. You know, the shadow and the shade is for all of the talented people that that we know are there, but they haven't gotten the spotlight, let's say, of a, someone that signed a major deal or has politics and advantages into the industry and they don't really want to deal with all the bullshit, but they just as creative and dope. Um, I think I've gotten my flowers because all the legends I work with on the album, they've given me that respect. All the writers, I mean, all the song, major artists that I have worked with, they've given me the respect that I know I deserve and know that I'm dope enough to work with the best. So yeah, I've gotten, I've gotten my flowers, I think. Of course, it's gonna keep going, but I got a lot of respect in the game, niggas know. Period, period, period. Yeah, yeah very, very well said. I, you mentioned politics just now, and you, I consider you in the industry, but do you feel like, is it because, okay, my question is, the politics and industry, do you feel like people in the industry are hating on you, where you could No, be? I don't like, I don't even like talking like that. I, okay. I hate when, I don't like when Because when you say politics, that. it's like. Yeah, I don't like when niggas be like, oh, they hating on me, or it's, we don't talk like that, because you got to think, energy, you can either give energy or take energy. It's only going one way or another. So it's so much love that 
the moment I give one second to any type of hate or try to notice it, I'm taken away from one of these motherfuckers that's showing me love. You dig what I'm saying? So the trajectory of my mind is always aimed towards the love and the positivity. I never speak on, oh, this nigga was hating on me. They ain't want me to, no, because I take what I want. Right. I take what I want. Right. I go out there and I get it. I don't make no excuses. I'm not asking for favors. I'm willing to put the work in and earn everything that I accomplish. So I don't really talk about no hate shit. Like that shit is stupid. Right. You know what I'm saying? So focus on the love. You know what I mean? If you got, you counting your haters, you could have counted that same amount of people that love you. Right. That you missed in the back because you worried about this. Right. I saw something, um, if you notice, people do that a lot. Like they'll they'll make these comments um, toward, like prime example, there was a chick on Shade Room recently. They, Shade Room does this thing where they do like lookalikes. Okay. You know, like they'll put like, oh, this person look like, this random person looks like this celebrity. Right, like celebrity lookalike. Yeah, it was a chick on there that got posted for that, that I know in Atlanta. And in the comments, it was so many people saying how pretty she was. They said she looked like G Herbo, mm -hmm. G Herbo's girl. Okay. And she looked, she's super beautiful. Everybody was saying it, but it was like a few people in there like, hell no. And she went live for like an hour addressing the haters. And I, and I think we do it, we do that a lot as people. Like all those people that showed you love is who you should have been presenting your brand or your business or your company to come see you at work to waitress that night. Right. That's who you should have been talking to. Right. But instead, you had your eye on the negativity. And I think we gotta stop doing that as people. I agree. Make some notes for him one time. Yeah. yeah. The, the positive energy, the positive energy. So you were also signed, remember we talked before you got here, you were signed to Cash Money for a little bit, worked yourself out the deal. Yeah. Touch on that a little bit. Um, I mean, some of those who know I signed to uh, in uh, 20, at the end of 2017, I had went independent for a long time. Like I broke a lot of records on Pandora for independent artists. I um, broke a lot of streaming records independently, but I felt like I wanted to compete with the top dudes and I was getting all of these label deals again, I mean label meetings again. I don't know if a lot of y'all know the unwritten rule, but the unwritten rule in the game is take all meetings, even if you're not going to sign, right? So at that time I, was, I wasn't going to do it, but I had signed four producers to me. Okay. Like, None of them had any money, never had a deal, no placements, nothing. So they was under me. I was taking all of these. I had meetings with 300, you know, um, Def Jam, Epic, you know, all of these labels, Atlantic, Interscope, everybody. And uh, at that time, I had just did a song with Birdman. My man GT Film shot the video in New York. It was a song called It's Calm. A nigga that I fuck with through the, um, that was rocking with him through business, connecting me with Birdman. Before we even did business, we was doing music. Okay. I was helping him with some songs and shit like that. And uh, he saw me post a picture at the Def Jam office, and he, he texted me like, yo, nephew, like, I see you taking, you know, meetings, you know, what you looking for? And I was like, yo, um, I'm, I think I'm about to do a deal with these people over here. He was like, yo, put on paper what you want, and uh, we gonna make it happen. So I put together what I wanted, Keep in mind at that time, I had already had my own bag. Like all the cars I was driving, everything, I had already bought. So I didn't really, it wasn't about the money, it was about, I wanted my producers to get a bag. So I told them oh, like- so you signed to go for your producers more so? I mean both, everybody, okay. you know what okay. I'm saying? So I told them I wanted all four of them to get 50,000 each. And at that time for a pub deal, that was not happening. Right. At that, 2017 niggas wasn't getting 50 grand for shit. So he was like, all right, we gonna work out a partnership. And he ended up doing it. We did the deal. And um, long story short, around, and I don't know if people know this about a deal, somebody may say, yo, I signed a million dollar deal, right? And um, what people don't know is, I did a deal for 300 grand cash, and then my budget was further more money. But what people don't understand about budget on contracts is, if that label doesn't approve when you ask for that amount, so say you got 200,000 in recording budget, 100,000 in touring budget on your contract. Right. That's not given to you in your events. But if I say, yo, I wanna go on tour, I need that 100,000, if that person in that office says no, you can't get it. Yeah, so um, I was going on tour with Black 
and Sabrina Claudio. I don't know if y'all remember the Free Black Tour. Yeah. I had got asked to do that tour. I was the, um, me, him, and Sabrina Claudio. So I had already got on my tour. You know, a label's job, they're supposed to put you on a tour, but they right. didn't do that. Right. So I had already dropped two mixtapes from Sean and Simon in February. Mm -hmm. Then the tour was coming to like October, November. So I was like, yo, Bird, tell the label, I want that tour budget. I don't want to go in my own pocket. I want, I want to get my bus. I want to get my merch. You know, tour is expensive. I don't know if y'all know that. Listen. Shit costs. I spent 33 grand going on that tour just to go. How many cities did it hit? It was about, I mean, it was, it was a long, it was a big ass tour. It was okay. about over maybe 40 cities, something like okay. that. It was crazy. Okay. Every show was sold out. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I asked for the money, my $50,000 tour budget. And they was like, nah, we're not, you know, they was going through the shit with Wayne. So it was like, no, we're not, uh, we're not approving any, any payouts right now. And the first time I got that no, I called my lawyer and I hit Bird. I was like, yo, this is not going to work. It's not going to work for me. I'm not asking for anything. I don't want favors. I want to, I got on my own sold out tour. Right. This shit is about to be huge and y'all not giving me my budget. So I went out. And he was like, uh, you know, let's let the lawyers figure it out. And uh, we're going to make it happen. And I always salute Birdman to this day. I never went public and dissed him because all he wanted was what he gave me. So I gave him that 300000 back. And then I, gave, I had to pay 67000 interest to the managers that connected me. And that's how I got out my deal with cash money. So do you and Birdman, are, do you guys still talk to this Still day? cool. Okay. I just talked to him the other day. Okay. But, uh. He's the one that signed off on it. He didn't want to, and he put me on to a lot of shit and taught me some shit that I would have paid millions for mm. and let me out. He basically loaned me 300 grand for nothing. Mm. And niggas don't do that in this game. No. And I think a lot of the frustration when people are trying to get out of bad contracts is they walk into it not making any money. So when they want to get out, they don't have any money to get out. This is a business. No one's in here to be giving you money and giving you their platform to just let you out. Oh, all right, go ahead, my nigga, you good? No, right. it's, it's gonna cost, and I was prepared for it, and I paid my money, and I got. And money Man did the same thing. We signed at the same time, mm -hmm. and me and Money Man, he got out a little bit before me, cause he had his money like the next day. He got the hell on him. Yeah, yeah. Salute my nigga Money Man. Y'all make some noise, Money Man. That nigga had. That nigga really he had. had his I, I never forget that. He really had his shit that that, that day. He got out his deal. He, he got did. That other one. I'm cracking up. So Big Pun is a very influential artist to you. I read that in yeah. a past interview. Yeah. Tell us about why well make you rest in peace, but tell us about why his artistry is so inspiring to you. Um I I mean Big Pun is from the Bronx. And I was born in the Bronx. And I just feel like at that time he was one of the best to do it and taught me a lot from how he rapped on a street record to a record for the females. He taught me a lot doing that, and I think I take that approach with his skill set. Um, so rest in peace, Big Pun. He's my favorite rapper from the Bronx of all time, and uh, I always study, study him. I love it. So you're an amazing performer. Thank you. How do you prepare for your live performances? You're welcome. Uh, like any other artist, I started in the mirror with a remote controller. Everybody don't start in the mirror with a remote controller. Yeah, they do. The real ones do. The real ones. Yeah, you either use a remote controller or a water bottle. Yeah, yeah. Or I used to use a ruler sometimes too, but I used to tear my room up. Like, I, um, yeah, I, I, I came up studying a lot of the GOATs performance-wise. Um, a lot of people could commend me for my show. That's how I was able to sell my show out without any big headliners or none of that, without, you know, so, you know, um, and I'm crazy as fuck, like, anybody let's that Let's talk about that, it, you are, well, yeah, let's I'm talk about the girls like. over your shoulder, like, <laughs> yeah. when did you start hanging girls over your shoulder, like, what's the trademark, what's the backstory, um, why are you carrying people's daughters around? Um, <laughs> I was like, what daughter he got on his shoulder? I mean, one, I understand it's concept, dope, it's really yeah, dope. thank you. I, I think, cause you know the from the block performances, the, the people from Chicago sh saluted them. Um, I was seeing that they was going viral with their videos, but I noticed that every artist was on there, either with guns or a bunch of niggas. I don't really like being around niggas at all. I hate hanging around niggas. And um, I could have had a girl on there twerking or some shit, but I was like, I was like, let me throw a chick over my shoulder. 
and see what see how people take it. So I took a risk with the viral shit, like, to, and, it, and it went, it right. worked. But it's hit or miss, like, that shit could have failed. Like, a lot of people was like, oh, the song dope, but the girl over his shoulder is stupid. But it was a lot of people that was like, yo, that shit was fire. So I just think taking risks with your content is key. I didn't really know where else to put her, and I didn't want her popping no pussy. So, and you I had been, I had been working out for her. Yeah, throw over the shoulder. That shit was hard to do, though. I was running, yeah. she, she was actually, more hurt than I was. Yeah. She looked so uncomfortable. She was struggling to breathe. Her stomach was on the shoulder. And she had the heels on. I was like, oh my god. Yeah, yeah, this, that, that was a dope little idea. This yeah. dope idea, dope. Okay, so mainstream artists, where's your opinion on where the music industry is going? Um, I think it's in an amazing place. I think a lot of the artists from back in the day that paved the way did a lot of shit for free. Didn't wasn't making money. Was getting raped by the labels. Um, management screwing them over. I think where streaming is and everything in the independent game right now, it's in an amazing place. And a lot of the people that are in the office at the DSPs are doing their fucking job. Like, a lot of the things that people notice, I hit all the top playlists. I'm independent. I got one motherfucker on my team, my, my manager Diana, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, Shout out to your manager. Yeah, um, I was on the front when everybody else dropped, when Adele and you know, Lil Durk and all them drop. I was on the front right with the new music on the hot, new hot songs. I was on the front. My picture was on the top of Apple Music, Spotify. So I think it's in a good place. I think that contracts need to go away. Mm. I think that once it goes there. You think that contracts need to go away? Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. I, well, do your paperwork. I, I believe that's cool. But I mean, as far as putting out music, I think that labels and management need to be held accountable for doing their job as well. It is the artist's job. The artist does need to remain independent and push his brand, but there's too many distribution companies. Like say, Carisha, you wanted to sign me, right? I'm the artist, and you telling me you could get me to this level, and I'm telling you I can present this music. Me and you could go do one project, or maybe two, and put it out and split what we agree on, and if it works, we do it again. And if it don't, we still collect that money from that project right. and just move on. Right. That's where the game should go. A lot of people are doing that. A lot of these artists collabing on mixtapes and stuff. That I, a lot of artists that have asked to manage me that I did songs and mixtapes with, that's the partnership that I did. I didn't want to sign them. I wanted them to remain a boss and a CEO of what they was doing with their business. So we just did joint projects and I got a bigger split because I'm the bigger artist. It's like boxing, it's like you get 60, right. other nigga get 40, I'm the A side, you the B side. After this fight, you fight somebody else, so we do a rematch. Right. I think it should go, the music game should turn into boxing without the promoter, mm. you know what I mean? And I think it's in a good spot. I hope, I hope the labels agree with that. They not gonna agree with it. Well, then they gonna have to get. But extra. they getting washed out though anyway. Yeah, they definitely getting they washed getting out. Wa if you notice, a lot of people are turning down deals, and a lot of people are turning down like the double XL freshman. Like it's more people turning it down than that they able to pick because they're like, I, I don't have to do this. Right. I don't need you. Y'all right. need us. Right. And that's what, how we're supposed. The, the we have to protect the creatives. You understand me? We have to protect the the business people are always protected, but. There's too many people that are not able to put out music right now because they're under bad, bad contracts. Right. There's so many kids out here that could, that get help from mental health or suicide because they're motivated from a weird type of artist like a Travis Scott or a Trippy Red or right. an XXX Tentacion, rest in peace. You know, imagine if those artists could keep creating to motivate those kids to not end their life today. But they can't because they can't put out music when they want. You know, that shit needs to stop. You know what I mean? I totally agree with you. Um, very, very well said. Can you make some noise for him one time for that game? That was that was super dope. Yeah. So your R and B side and your rap side is like night and day. Uh huh. You know that, right? I, I I guess. Yeah. Nah. I guess. How do you how do you turn it on and off like that? Um, it just depends on the beat, but I don't think it's night and day to me. I feel like whether you listen to my hip hop side or my R and B side. It's very much so my life. And so I just feel like I'm either describing something me and my niggas did in the street, or I'm describing something me and my girl just went through at the, at, at the crib. Mm -hmm. It's all the same thing to me. So it just, on one, it's a lot less melody 
and not as aggressive. Um, but I treat my voice like an instrument on any record that I get on. And my, my lyrics are very personal. And it's going to always be, I don't really, you know, separate the two. Right. Which one do you prefer doing better? Hip hop. The, the hip hop. Hip hop all day. Can we hip, talk? Hip hop all day. I should have known. Yeah. Can we talk about disgusting? Oh my God. Right, go ahead. What's the backstory? It's, I mean, everybody I a freak. To ask. Everybody in here is a freak. Right? Or whether you. Do we have any freaks on the left side? Every motherfucker in here is a freak. <laughs> yeah, so. I just think on that song, I was describing what I'm into. Everybody in here into some different nasty shit, whether they gay, straight, bisexual, or they got 15 wives like my man. You know, I think, three wives. Oh, three. Three, three wives. Yeah, three wives. I think everybody into what they into. That record is for that. It's for like, what, what are you into in the bedroom? How nasty are you willing to go? That's what I did on that song. I don't. I didn't really have a lot of sex songs before that. No. I never did that. Okay, so yeah, that was like the, that was the coming out for you. Like, let me just put it all. Yeah, like I ain't gonna that. say I came out. Pause, it's but not coming out like that. But that was like, let me just show them how freaky yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, that was that was that was for all my freaky motherfuckers. I kind of heard that you like to spit in. Oh no no, wow. Jesus Christ! <laughs> You're in the hot seat, so. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little hot over there. Um, nah, I ain't gonna say I like to do that, but it's not like a habit, but. Okay. I don't that, really that's, got, that's really good to know. I just ain't really got, like, if I got a girl that I'm fucking with, I don't really got no rules. Just don't do no gay shit to me. Facts. Like, that's just my only rule. Like, Facts. Other than that, like, we could do anything it. Anything goes. Anything, anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Period. Period. We love it. So your business ventures, um, we're doing laptops now in the MacBooks with yeah. all the all the settings on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um I, I pretty much build studios, mobile studios, not like a big old studio building. But if you're an artist and you want to be on the move and sound like you're at a million dollar studio, I've mastered that. I've figured out how to put a, a million dollar sounding studio in like your fucking book bag that you can take from your crib to your hotel to your baby mama house, to your side bitch house, to the mall, in the Sprinter, in the car. Like, we could go in the car right now with my setup, and it's gonna sound like you at Paramount Studios in LA. I've, I've, I'm able to put that together for artists, because I was tired of artists not being able to afford studio time. I think it's pivotal that every artist learns how to record themselves and learn how to put music together on their own without waiting for an engineer. The more and more you can eliminate somebody you have to wait for, the more chances you have to succeed. I agree. So that's is what it, I provide. Is it easy to use, the laptop? Huh? Does, is the platform, is, the, is it easy for artists to use? Or is it- I don't like the word easy, like I don't like the word hate. Okay. Nothing, anything easy ain't even worth having. Right. But if you put the time in, you will learn it. Work. Yes. Okay. If you if you if you take the time that you take the time to smoke or drink or fuck or do anything else or watch Netflix, the same time that you can watch a whole series, the same time it takes to learn how to record yourself. Let me put it that way. If you ever watched the show from season one to season whatever, you, you could have learned. You could learn how to record yourself. Yes. So. Well, it's that good. quick. So how are you balancing fatherhood with your career? Balance and fatherhood. Balancing fatherhood. Um, Are you a single father? Yeah, I'm a single father. Okay. Two kids, a son and a daughter, full time, full custody of my son. You know what I mean? Um, to be honest, I don't really balance like that. Mm. I just put my children first. Right. You dig what I'm saying? I put my kids first, and then from that, I hustle hard in the pocket. You know what I mean? Like, you know, my dad taught me something as a as a as a youngin. My mom gave me all these rules for parenthood. It was a lot, but my dad simply said, you know, take it one day at a time and put him first every day and then take care of you. And so from there, when I was waking up, you know, you know, the first thing you do when you wake up, you put some clothes on, all right, I'm gonna get him dressed first. You brush your teeth, all right, I'm gonna brush this nigga teeth first. You make something to eat, I'm gonna make his plate first. And that's how my day go. You know what I'm saying? And so I kind of took parenthood like that. I don't really balance, I don't put music before. I, I probably could have went on two tours last year, but my son had two basketball seasons that I was coaching. Mm. 
and I couldn't leave. So, so he played basketball. You he both nice, played. yeah. So I turned it down. Okay. I didn't go on the road for 60 days because my son had a season, and I didn't want to miss it. And so that's not balancing. That's just this comes first, you know, and uh, that's what's important to me. That's definitely important. Yes, yes. What are your yes? Congratulations. Do you feel like he's going to go into the industry too as an artist? Your son? My son? Uh. I'm gonna keep it a thousand. My son could do anything and I'm riding with him. Anything that ain't something stupid and illegal, like I did illegal shit so he don't have to. So my, like I started my son playing basketball and learned, he's, he done sold waters in the neighborhood before cause that's what I started doing, hustling and hooping. But my son been playing ball since he was five, he loves it. But if my son was to look at me tomorrow and say, dad, I don't like basketball, I wanna, be a doctor, I want to sell flowers, I'm going to put the bag behind a fucking garden tomorrow. Right. And we're going to throw that basketball away. Because I'm going to be behind whatever he with, and I'm going to make sure I got that bag. It's not about me, him. We got to stop making our kids want to do what we want to do. Just because we failed at it don't mean that we got to make him do it or her do it. Right. It's about what they love to do and make sure that he understands the difference between hard work and people that's out, out here bullshitting. That's what my son know. He got friends in the neighborhood. If you ever watch my story, my son can't touch his Xbox. My son got PS5, Xbox series, the, the Oculus, iPhone, but he can't touch that shit till he give me 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, 100 uh, lifts with the dumbbells, do his chores, take the trash out, and go outside and run a little bit. Then he can fucking play. How old is he? My son 11, and he can't do all that shit. Mandatory. We got a young we kid. Don't let y'all kids sit in them fucking tablets and I, I know it's easy to make them let them do that and you want to do what you want to do, but you got to balance it out. They have to know that there's something that comes before that, before playing. And right. my son understands that shit early. Right. You know? And you got a daughter too? My daughter, three. That's my best friend. That's your best friend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My daughter, Aria, um, look just like me and my son. You know what I'm saying? And, Everybody that know how close I am with my kids. And I'm gonna be honest, like, I prayed, I'm, I'm just gonna tell y'all some real shit. When my daughter was, when my baby moms was pregnant, I prayed not to have a daughter. I did, I didn't want no girl, I was scared. You prayed not I to prayed to God. Why were you scared? Because you are amazing. I'm just being honest, I was so afraid of what, a, what that little woman was gonna force me to do, but I needed her. I really needed my daughter, and I've apologized for that prayer, and I also thank God for rejecting that prayer and giving me something that he helped me understand women to a way that I didn't see them before I had her. And, you know, I gotta be patient with her. She wanna talk all day, she got mood swings. I can't just be like, your Uber outside. I gotta deal with her now, so. Is she playing Coca Melly? Coca Melon, all Coca that shit, Boss Baby, everything. Yeah, so, uh, you got your hands yeah, I, got, I got a three year old. She about to turn four July 2nd. God bless you. Her birthday is on the way. You ready for some hot seat questions? Hot seat? Yes. <laughs> what that mean? <laughs> it means you're in a hot seat and we're going to ask, I'm going to ask you some hot seat questions. I don't, okay. It's not too spicy. Hot, hot seat? Hot seat questions are loud with me, sure. What is the biggest flex about you? Uh. Biggest flex, I never lost a fight. It's a big flex, it's a big flex. What's your favorite hood meal? Hood meal? Yeah. Favorite struggle meal, favorite uh, only got $10 and everybody got to eat meal. Frosted Flakes. Yeah, yeah. Who's big it? ass bowl of Frosted Flakes. With some sugar? No, I don't need to add no sugar. Okay. That shit already got it on there. <laughs> Who is the queen of R&B currently? Queen of R&B? Yes. Damn, currently? Currently. Damn, that's so tough. I know. Emphasis so on, many, emphasis so on many curly. Good people. Right now, I love Jasmine Sullivan and Ari Linux. Those are. Shout out to Jasmine from Philly. I'm gonna go Tom. Jasmine Sullivan on the voice, yeah. but I'm gonna go Ari Linux on the transparency. I love who she is. Um, but those are my favorite too. There ain't nobody fucking with them. Well said. What's the wildest night you ever had in the studio? Wildest night I ever had in the studio? 
What happened? I was at Patchwork. Oh, Lord. When, I don't want to say his name, but one of my niggas shot another nigga by accident. At Patchwork when Gucci and them was dead. This is, I, I can't really kick this story through the street code, but one of my niggas shot another nigga by accident. The bullet hit the wall, he, his gun hit the floor, and the bullet went off the wall, hit him in the thigh. And uh, that was crazy. And the nigga that got hit kept it gangster. And when the cops asked what happened, he said he didn't know. And him and, him and the other nigga was supposed to work out the hospital bills later. So nobody got arrested. That happened at Patchwork Studio. That's though. a wild night. That's a wild night. That's I'm, a true story. I'm cracking up. What's the worst thing a girl can do on a first date? A girl? Yes. The worst thing a girl could do on a first date? Take a video of the food before she prays over it. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I mean, it's cool to get the video, like when she get the video without me in it, and then like she didn't bless I her think, food. I think we just be so excited about the food. I think girls- But just, just bless your bless food you. first, yeah. and I don't give a fuck. But if you do that and eat right after without praying, I don't, I don't really fuck with that. I, don't really, I, I mean, it's cool, I'm not gonna judge it, but right. that's like the worst thing you probably could do on a day. So now the ladies know. went half, gave them thousands of dollars, and I felt like it didn't really work. That's how I felt. No shade the world stuff. I felt like it didn't work. It didn't really bring me real numbers and real results. So I never did it again. But I was satisfied the fact that now I know that shit really don't do nothing. These numbers really are efficient. You know what I mean? And so I couldn't even regret doing something like that. Even at the time, my manager's like, yo, or I paid for a lot of PRs and publicists like this industry has 90% terrible PRs and publicists, right? These motherfuckers do not do their job, right? And even the ones that are good, they only have so much pull because that publication has to still want that work. And I paid for a lot of them niggas that didn't get a lot of results, but I learned. At the time, my manager's like, oh, this person didn't do their job. I'm like, no, this is what we needed to learn. There's no regret in this. I now know that I'm never giving this motherfucker five grand for two months again. And we, as a team, need to have something more presentable that they want to suck dick on. It's a dick sucking industry. They're not here to show love. They're here because I got a song with Future and they want it first. They don't care if I got a song by myself. All the songs that I had to pitch on my album was the one with Jada Kiss and Benny the Butcher. I knew Raekwon, Big Trick, that's what they wanted. They didn't want the one when I was by myself. They, oh, they asked for this one. Double XL posted my album because I had that and not just me. So I have no regrets. You know what I mean? Well said. You had a question? A little louder, sweetie. Yeah, come closer. Yes, come closer. Who is that? Who is that? Hey, Kay. What, a little louder, sweetie. What would you tell artists to look at for when they're looking for mentorship? Um, shit, I mean, well, with mentorship, the, the, the way the game is now, this, everything is a mentor. From having a mentor, because mentors come organically, I believe. I don't think you should look for a mentor. I don't think you should look for a manager. But there's so many, like, you ever watch an interview and they say one motherfucking thing? or go to church one day and like the pastor say one thing that applies just to you. I think mentorship comes with you applying what you're listening to. You gotta make sure that you're applying what you're hearing, what what uh, what relates to you. If you hear something and you, and you amen that, it's your job to put your feet on that. And if you don't, there is no mentorship. You just hearing shit at the end of the day. So, so Queen, Jay, my advice to you is everything that you're hearing, apply it, and as you apply, that means you gotta sacrifice something else that you've been leaning on that you might not need, because that's how you accomplish things. You can't bring everything that you had the day before. Something gotta go that you didn't need. And if you're not willing to make those sacrifices, Jay, it won't happen. There will be no mentorship. So I've been mentored 
my main mentor is a, a, a guy that I, I um, known as Freddie Fox Pumpy Numbers. Um, but and also a big homie named Fort Knox. You know, anybody know Fort Knox in Atlanta? He gives the hardest handshake in the world. Fort Knox taught me something that I didn't even think that he knew he taught me. So I went to him later and said, you were one of my mentors. I was in a cypher one day, um, me, Trans Lee, and Saha the Prince. The cypher told us all to only rap for third, for uh, one minute. So I, I went by the rules. And in that time, I did my verse, we all killed it, and Saha went after me, and this nigga rapped for like four minutes and took the crowd away. Like, he killed it. We all had good verses, but I felt like he killed it. And after the show, Fort Knox pulls me to the side and says, young nigga, don't you know that when the mic is in your hand, the world is yours? And I'm like, well, big homie, they said 60 seconds. I said, fuck that, this is hip hop. There are no rules. Make them take that mic from you. And in that moment, he was my mentor. And if you look at my Sway in the Morning freestyle on my page, I rapped for five, six minutes straight. I didn't breathe. They had to turn the beat off. And they was probably sitting there like, why did you rap so long? Because Fort Knox told me, they gonna have to take this mic from me, nigga. I'm not stopping. And uh, that's mentorship right there. Question, right, right side, question, one more question, who? Right side, right side. Okay. Hey, yo, for, for the record, even if anybody else has a question, I'm not no Hollywood nigga. Even when the cameras is off, y'all can walk up to me and ask me personally, and I will tell you when I won't leave until whoever has a question and get an answer. I'll stay in this motherfucker. So, you got the last one, but, well but I'm not going nowhere like I'm actually. It's a party tonight. What's your name, mama? Tanya. Hi. Hey, Tanya. Hey, Tanya. Hey, Tanya. A little louder, Tanya. Act like you arguing with your nigga. I don't know, he's right. Oh my God, okay. Salute, salute. I heard you say When you say the man, you mean a male or the or the white man? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Like, um, well, one, some of the things I've already told you, like, I've had opportunities, just to go down the list, shit. I've, a lot of artists I, that have asked Bay to sign to me, I didn't do, and I did partnerships with them. That's one of the things I do. I put niggas on a lot of game, even if they do a paid consultation. Two, I started building studios. I, I probably sold, 200, 300 laptops and put studios and houses of niggas that never knew shit about Pro Tools or music. So I found a way to get in touch with artists myself to let them learn how to really learn this music game. That's another thing I do for the culture. Three, um, just simply being around, I mean, a lot of the things people know, if you've ever been around me is, you know, I feed homeless a lot, but I refuse to do it on camera. I do it with my kids. I don't like to do it on my platform. I do a lot of shit for the homeless off camera. If you anybody that's ever been around me and, and helped me with doing that, you know that. And I keep that off camera and I keep that off of social media and any shit like that. I do a shitload of shit for the culture and I think it's important that we represent as people. And just, first of all, just being who you are as a good black person is a lot for the culture. That's the start, you know? And I think us having that independence with our business and our brain and doing good business is the start for them. And also, being open-minded for these kids. Like, we have to understand this generation, they're going through a lot of shit, they're seeing a lot of shit, and we have to make it our job to step in and not judge them and do as much as we can for them. 
And I think I do a huge thing with that too. Like I told you, my son's basketball team, I didn't just go to my son's games, I coached it. I coached two teams last year while dropping two albums. I coached an all black team, and I coached, my son played on a team with all young black kids, and another team where he was the only black kid and the rest of them were white. I coached both those teams. So I'm all in the culture, baby, all in it. And I'm outside for real. All in the culture, and he marrying a black woman. Plug in your social media links. We got one artist that we got to put on the stage, but he will, like you said, never with you guys. Plug in your social media links. Where can they follow you at? Hey, my, uh, my Instagram is Sire the Kid, S-Y-A-R-I-D-A-K-I-D. -I, um, I also got a chauffeur business. Anybody ever need celebrating a um, birthday party or event, need a um, black on black SUV or a Sprinter with a driver, I, I'll give you my business card. Let's chop it up. But that's my side business that a lot of people know me for. And if anybody need a, a mobile studio, come chop it up with me. I do that too. And uh, other than that, you know, I'm outside. Outside. Make sure y'all pick up the album. It's out now. Yeah. Make sure you guys are checking the love with me. So thank you. Follow him on all platforms. You know where to follow me at. At Kalisha the Diva everywhere. Thank you for checking in. Just stand up there. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah, me and my brothers been fighting together. Klitsch gold. When I got some shit to address, I don't need no zip code. Big goals. She said, Am I really this cold? <laughs> Does Mono Ginobili have a big nose? Switch roles. I'm from the era where rappers wore big clothes. Whoa, now I'm reaching for the throne. I might this hold.